Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm in the unenviable position of uh, speaking to you after your lunch break. Uh, so I will try and make this as entertaining as possible. My name is Jeff Hallington. I'm one of the leaders of the FACE Consortium, and I'm uh, glad to be giving you a FACE overview uh, for the next 25 minutes. This overview, you've heard a lot of conversation already this afternoon uh, with respect to several of the technical aspects of the FACE technical standard. I'm here to talk uh, a little bit lighter with respect to the technical details, and I'm going to focus a lot more on the business aspects, the why of FACE, and the motivations behind it, and a little bit about the structure of the organization that is working to develop that FACE technical standard. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and go forward uh, for the why of the FACE technical standard. And it kind of comes back to the trends within avionics software development. And I want to emphasize the software piece to that. The trends are that as capabilities are increasing, as the need for increased airspace capability, um, work, pilot workload reduction, uh, the ability to increase safety of flight, software has taken the front seat with respect to avionics capabilities. The figure I show here on the screen, 70 to 90% of aircraft capability, avionics capability is now implemented as software on board that. Um, and uh, commensure it with that shift from the hardware focus towards software, you're starting to see complexity increase as those capabilities increase, cost, time to field are elements that mm, they're starting to see a lot of growth in those, that's not really a good thing. Uh, and that a, that's a, an issue for both commercial as well as military avionics developments. So um, as we, we took a look around, a number of us in the industry took a look around as far as what we could do about that. We noticed several trends within the commercial uh, airspace industry and primarily with respect to uh, open standards, open architecture, and so forth. And so we started uh, gem germinating the idea of what could we do in leveraging uh, that. Now, another motivation that we have with respect to uh, the FACE Consortium and the FACE Technical Standard has to do with what our adversaries are doing. And our adversaries are utilizing asymmetrical techniques, utilizing commercial off-the-shelf items, uh, taking a very uh, fast approach uh, with respect to developing uh, their weapon systems. And the, uh, the quote I show on the bottom here, six to one, that ratio, uh, when I heard that, um, that ratio as it applied to uh, development of anti-aircraft systems by an adversary as compared to a single development cycle for the aircraft, the fighter aircraft that was designed to go against that threat. Um, I was floored. I, I heard that at the April Spies Conference uh, keynote presentation there, and I started thinking about the commercial world. When you're looking at competition that's outrunning you to that degree, that's a recipe for going out of business, right? And you know, when you think about it from a defense standpoint, that's a recipe for defeat and an unacceptable defeat as far as we're concerned. So a number of individuals who were visionary with respect to that software development, the ability for us to uh, break those issues that we were seeing with cost and, and time to field, uh, started getting together under the leadership of uh, U.S. Navy Navier, uh, PMA 209, and we began to discuss what are the issues that we're facing, getting to a, a greater level of detail, uh, and discovered that, uh, you know, certain things stood out, right? Uh, the development of avionics, the development of aircraft systems in general, uh, essentially resulted in a siloed development cycle 
where the end result was capabilities that really they, they, they kind of stuck with the aircraft itself. That specific aircraft type model series and we had a difficult time, a uh, very expensive, very lengthy process of trying to uh, port that kind of capability to other aircraft. So you essentially ended up with a repeating cycle as you went from aircraft to aircraft. Um, drove cost and, and, and schedule. Uh, long integration cycles. Um, when we take a look at uh, what standards that avionics development uh, utilized, uh, not everyone was on the same sheet of music. And for us, we, we saw the end result, uh, multiple integration efforts, multiple development efforts, again, uh, a, a lack of the ability to, to really concentrate on what you really needed to concentrate on, which was driving innovation into your capabilities, driving advanced capabilities into your aircraft. You're spending a lot of time trying to, to just move things around. And so, as again, as we looked at the commercial world, looked at integrated modular uh, architecture, avionics, um, started looking at, at how we could leverage perhaps the same ideas, maybe not the same ideas, but certainly similar ideas. We started seeing uh, a model by which use, utilizing standard architecture, utilizing open interfaces, we could drive leverageability of components from platform to platform if we develop them correctly. And uh, that allows us to optimize in investments uh, for capability innovation. Uh, focusing on what really mattered the most and then being able to uh, enable that faster integration to cut the time to field. So again, um, taking that cue from the open architecture, uh, the group of us who started the phase consortium idea, we began to think about uh, the openness of the interfaces, the architecture, and the standards that we wanted to utilize. Think about the, the, the phone that's in your pocket, right? Uh, it's very straightforward for you as a user of your, of your phone to be able to go to an app store and to download an app of your liking for the purposes that you need it for and operate that on your phone. You don't need to know very much about the phone itself, but you do have assurance that the manufacturer of that phone, the operating system that, that is on it, uh, there's enough openness to that where third-party developers can develop an ecosystem of applications and you benefit by that wide variety and for that matter, uh, the cost effectiveness uh, of those applications. <clears throat> so we wanted to move from the legacy world of a closed system controlled by a single vendor, uh, vendor locked, if you will, and go more toward that open, open standard for, um, for the operating system, for the middleware pieces, and then, of course, for the applications themselves that implement the business logic for the capability. And do so in a way that uh, if there's an application developer that's out there and they really don't know very much about the system itself and how their application is going to be hosted, uh, yet they are really smart at developing the business logic behind the capability that's innovative for you. They still can participate in that market, team up with others, and develop the application, do the testing, and do the integration in cooperation with others. And now you've got the ingredients for true cost and schedule reduction. So those of you who are familiar with software development, you are probably familiar with some of the standards that I show listed up here. POSIX, uh, A-Rank 661, A-Rank 6653, OpenGL. Some of those have existed for a long, long time. Uh, POSIX, uh, an outgrowth of the Unix wars back in the 1980s, of which the Open Group uh, had a hand at, uh, at helping to resolve. 
one of the reasons why we picked them to help manage the FACE consortium. Um, these are standards that are well known. Uh, they're usable, they're open, and we felt that that was a great foundation for us uh, to place into the FACE technical standard. But the real value add that the FACE consortium felt would be um, extremely important for uh, utilization in that technical standard is the, is the structure, the architecture, if you will, whereby modular components are capable of being placed into that structure in a way that allows for the portability and reuse and, um, and, and others are able to understand what you placed into that system, standard data models to understand the data flows from your module to somewhere else, and now the integration process becomes easier. These, in the end, permit life cycle competition uh, by many players in the marketplace. And again, when you do that, now your differentiation in that marketplace is how innovative is your capability going on board that, that, uh, that software piece. But we also looked at, well, how are we going to pick which open standard uh, interfaces to use for the software? How are we going to develop that standard architectural structure? And we felt it was hugely important for us to implement a voluntary consensus standards body uh, formulated underneath with a, a, a good legal foundation. And OMB Circular A119 uh, was really important for us, allowed for government participation uh, to take place and as well the National Cooperative Research and Production Act uh, which allowed industry to gather together with protection from things like antitrust issues and if we were following the rules with respect to uh, the, the consensus body, the fair and equal representation, due, due process, the appeals process, driving toward consensus then we had that foundation for an, an adoptable standard by as many people in the industry as we could reach. The overall goal for the FACE Consortium, which was started in 2010, again with the leadership of uh, the Navy Nav Air Organization, the Open Group, and uh, I would say about 15 or so uh, organizations that served as charter members was to create the ability for independent third-party vendors to, to provide portable and reusable software components that would be hosted on top of essentially a face environment. <clears throat> and this, this is kind of the most um, popular chart that we use to identify the face architecture each of the booths that you will see in our exhibit hall are required to have a representation of this face architecture and the components that they are demonstrating or they're showing as part of their booth, they need to represent that in the different layers that exist in the face architecture. The business uh, in the most important piece for us are two of the segments in this architecture the portable component segment, as well as the platform specific services segment, which allow for that portable and reusable component to reside. And the interfaces that we have chosen for those components to interface to the rest of the system, we have carefully identified what calls are allowed that would allow for uh, those components to not have to know what's underneath the hood, so to speak. They're hardware agnostic, they're sensor agnostic, and then if you're done doing it right, uh, operating system agnostic, and uh, you, you do not have to understand the device drivers that you're working with or other things that would necessarily tie your component to the underlying system. Therefore, we're making that reusability and portability much more easier. The rest of the segments, the transport services segment, the IO services segment, and of course the operating system segment, those are probably what we would consider 
the pieces of the environment that those portable and reusable components are going to operate on top of. And it, those are huge with respect to being able to transform the calls from those portable and reusable components to interface with the hardware and sensors as, as needed. Also important is independent verification that you have followed the FACE technical standard and all of the requirements necessary for portable and reusable components. We have a multi-step process. Uh, again, independent VAs, uh, verification authorities, they run the tests, they do the inspections uh, necessary for them to say, yes, you have followed the standard you now have the ability of obtaining a FACE certificate, which uh, the certification authority uh, will grant, and um, the certification authority also maintains the integrity of the process by allowing for uh, auditability of the testing that the VAs do. There are multiple VAs that we have, and there's one single certification authority that kind of oversees uh, their work. Uh, at the last step of the process, we have a library administrator. Once you have uh, successfully obtained a, face, uh, obtained a face certificate, you are now able to list your software on a face library page that the face consortium maintains. Hugely important for the marketing of your face components and allows for independent verification by a customer <clears throat> uh, potential customer that uh, allows them to say, yes, I see that you are listed, I know that you have a face certificate, and uh, gives them assurance that we have an, a, a marketplace with integrity uh, and the ability for, uh, for them to say, yes, I, I want to I select a face uh, certified product. And I think a measure of success with respect to uh, having application of the FACE technical standard is right here. The number of FACE certified components that have entered into the FACE library since 2017 when we started that program, we're now at 19 components from 12 different suppliers. More are in the pipeline. They are covering all of the FACE segments uh, that are in our architecture and there's quite a number of uh, capabilities that are represented by those components. Uh, again, we have in the hall a number of the vendors. These vendors here are represented. Uh, they are given uh, special signage. If they are part of the FACE library, uh, please go uh, visit them, check them out, and talk to them about their FACE conformant products. So I've given you kind of a, a really brief overview, um, kind of lacking in details. There are many documents of various um, levels of detail that are available for you to get started with the FACE technical standard with understanding the FACE concepts. They range in, uh, with respect to guides for business, contracting, and that's both uh, industry as well as government contracting officers and uh, for programmers themselves. Uh, kind of the getting started um, aspects of what FACE is all about and allows you to ease into the concept. Uh, again, if you have software expertise with some of the standards that I talked about earlier, you have a great foundation to begin with the FACE technical standard. If you're, uh, if you're the, the, the nerd type uh, that wants to get into the major details, uh, there is the FACE technical standard itself and a companion document called the FACE Reference Implementation Guide. Uh, these are very lengthy documents. They will get you into the details uh, as necessary for successfully uh, implementing FACE conformant products. They are available on the Open Group website. We have the web page information on the lower left. It's probably hard to see uh, at uh, your distance there. But www.opengroup.org backslash face. 
And from there, uh, you'll find information about the consortium, about the open group, and the documents that we have available. There is a link called Documents and Tools. Check that page out. Uh, those are available for free. Consortium members, we're at, um, I think we normally say 80 plus members. We didn't typically have a little bit of churn from year to year, but overall we're maintaining around the 80 mark. Uh, and uh, uh, the who's who of the defense industry is represented here, government, uh, industry, as well as academia. Um, all have been involved. They all are uh, essentially paying for their own time, their own way uh, to provide their experts for each of the face meetings. If you're interested in joining, uh, please see the open group booth in the exhibit hall and they will provide you with the information you need. Again, I identified myself as one of the face leaders in the consortium. We have a whole host of them uh, working on both business as well as technical, as well as data architecture. These are hardworking individuals who are spending, again, uh, a lot of time with this. And we, we joke as we meet from time to time that you know, we're, we're doing our night job. Uh, we have our day jobs with respect to our employers and uh, so this is a lot of work, and I want to thank those who are in the audience who are uh, listed on this list for uh, helping out. Uh, I can't identify a finer group of individuals to be working with on this initiative. And finally, <clears throat> you know, we, we end um, a lot of presentations with this quote. This quote graces the front page of many of our documents. And it kind of harkens back to that problem statement that I talked about in the beginning. The time and cost growth that we've seen with the increasing capabilities uh, that are going on board our warfighter aircraft and uh, the complexity that that's driving. And the fact that our adversaries are doing all that they can to outrun us with respect to innovation. It's time to recapture that back for the U.S. warfighter and our allies. It's a necessary thing. It's important for us. Otherwise, this will happen. And uh, we don't want that to happen. So thank you for your time and your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have.